So in the last video, we talked about electron and hole concentration, or N and P, where N is the electron concentration, uh, typically given in uh, per centimeter cubed units, so number of electrons per centimeter cubed, and P, which is the hole concentration. And we said that at uh, around T equals 300 Kelvin, uh, each of these was equal to each other. So N naught was equal to P naught, P naught, which was 1.5 times 10 to the 10 uh, per centimeter cubed. So charge carriers per centimeter cubed. And we said that this was, this we referred to as Ni or the intrinsic semiconductor electron concentration. We could have also called it PI, but you know, electrons are uh, easier conceptually to deal with than holes. So we just said Ni instead. So now this seems kind of restrictive. It seems that we can't really, uh, there's not a lot we can do about the number of electrons and the number of holes. But in fact, we can, we have a great deal of control over the number of electrons and holes in a semiconductor. And that can, that, that's done through a process called doping. And basically, uh, not, not to be confused with what athletes do, although the process is somewhat similar. Um, basically, if you've got a block of silicon, it's got a bunch of silicon atoms inside it. And these are bonded to each other and so on and so forth. Now, if I wanted to introduce additional electrons, uh, one way I could do that is, well, let's just take, uh, let's just take a bunch of electrons outside and just throw them at the semiconductor. Let's just bombard the semiconductor with electrons. Um, but that wouldn't work very well uh, because these electrons, basically, as soon as they got the chance, they'd leave the semiconductor. So once the semiconductor came into contact with a uncharged with something uncharged, the electrons would just very quickly migrate out. So we want to introduce electrons without changing the total charge of silicon. Um, and we do this with what are called dopants. So the dopant that we can use to add electrons is phosphorus. And phosphorus has five electrons sitting in its outer shell or its valence shell, and silicon only has four. So if we introduce phosphorus into the silicon lattice, it will bond uh, just because of the structure of the silicon crystal. It will bond to the nearby silicon atoms with you know, the traditional double bonds. Uh, and each of the silicons contributes a single electron, but the phosphorus has this extra electron sitting here. And this extra electron isn't bound to anything because silicon doesn't want any more bonds and phosphorus certainly can't handle any more bonds. In fact, this, this electron uh, isn't even allowed to be uh, on the phosphorus according to high school chemistry because the valence shell of phosphorus can only handle eight electrons. So this electron is just going to, it's just going to leave. Um, and this electron we say has now entered the conduction band. So the electron is free to move and conduct however it wants. Now, if you're being careful, uh, you might say, well, uh, you've left behind a hole on the phosphorus. So that hole can also move around and do whatever it wants. So you haven't actually changed anything. You've just increased the total concentration. But this does not leave behind a hole. Um, it leaves behind a positive charge on this phosphorus. So there's no... Uh, there's no empty state that an electron can jump into. All of these bonds are fully formed. Uh, there's no electron that can contribute to further bonding with the phosphorus. And this positive charge stays localized to the phosphorus and does not uh, attract, well, it, it attracts electrons, but it does not bind electrons. It does not prevent electrons from moving. It's not an available state that the electron can hop into. So by adding dopant atoms, uh, we're able to affect the concentration of electrons without affecting the overall system charge and without affecting the number of holes. So we can increase the number of electrons uh, without 
a change in the number of holes. So the number of holes stays constant and the total charge stays the same. Now, this isn't exactly true, uh, at least not in an equilibrium standpoint. So immediately after we add the phosphorus, we add an, elect an additional electron to the semiconductor and we have this positive bound charge on the phosphorus, even though there's, it's completely bonded, there's no available states uh, for the electron to, to come, come back to. Um, technically there is, but we'll go over that in the next video. Uh, so we've got an extra electron floating around and we know that we've got a bunch of holes floating around in the semiconductor. Uh, and we've now got even more electrons floating around in the semiconductor. So you might think, well, uh, these electrons, um, if they come into contact with one of the holes, so if a hole and an electron meet, they annihilate each other. So the electron occupies the space of the hole and there's no more of either. They've formed a bond, essentially. Um, so you might say, well, the more electrons I have, the more likely a hole is to meet the electrons. So we would actually expect the hole concentration to decrease. And that's true. Uh, this is actually an example of a rate law um, from chemistry. Basically, it says that the if you are expecting a reaction to happen, uh, the speed of the reaction is proportional to the amount of reactants. So the speed of recombination of these two carriers, uh, electrons and holes, is proportional to both the number of electrons and the number of holes. So we do actually decrease the number of holes and the rate law uh, is given by the following equation. And that's that the number of electrons multiplied by the number of holes is equal to the square of the intrinsic carrier concentration. And uh, the you can do a quick sanity check on, on this equation. Basically at equilibrium or uh, without, if you don't dope the semiconductor, the intrinsic electron concentration times the intrinsic hole concentration, well, these are both the same and they're each equal to an I so this should be equal to ni times ni or ni squared. Um, there's also a mathematical way to derive this relationship, with, which is nothing but a chemistry, uh, chemistry rate law. Uh, so basically, if you increase the number of electrons, you have to decrease the number of holes. So if I had 10 electrons uh, and 10 holes initially, and then I doubled the number of electrons to 20, uh, I would need to have the number of holes to five. So we're able to both simultaneously increase the number of electrons and decrease the number of holes in, in a semiconductor. And this allows us to uh, determine which carrier is the dominant charge carrier. Now, similar to adding an element like phosphorus in basically the same exact kind of process, uh, we can add an electron poor element. So we can add something like boron, which only has three uh, electrons to contribute. So if we add boron into the silicon lattice and uh, basic, how do we add boron into the lattice? Well, we literally just throw it at the piece of silicon really, really hard. Uh, and that basically means you have to use a high temperature or very uh, shoot boron out of a gun really, really fast. It's essentially what it comes down to. So this boron will form bonds with the silicon that are adjacent to it. Uh, and each of those silicon contributes one electron. The boron contributes one electron. And then this last silicon atom, it contributes one electron, but the boron has no, no electron to give. Um, let me just erase this, erase this arrow real quick. Um, the boron has no electron to give. And initially, the boron is neutrally charged. It has no charge, uh, despite the fact that it's quote unquote missing an electron. Uh, it's just an element with no charge. Um, so, but the silicon wants to bond to its neighbor boron, but the boron doesn't have an available electron to do that. So there's an empty state here or a hole. Um, so this, empty state 
is very easily accessible by electrons moving around the lattice. So the electron can hop in and fill this hole. Mathematically equivalently, this hole can migrate around and go and meet other electrons. So we can dope a semiconductor with either a group, this is called a group three element because it's got three electrons and phosphorus was a group five element because it has five electrons. But the basic idea is you're doping the semiconductor. So you're, chain, you're swapping out uh, an atom of silicon for an atom of boron or an atom of phosphorus. And you're either introducing an additional electron or an additional hull. And so similarly, uh, we've got the same rate law equation for this. So n times p is still equal to ni squared. So if we double the number of holes with this method, the number of electrons will drop by half. And for this reason, we call this semiconductor uh, a p-type semiconductor if it's been doped with boron. If it's been doped with phosphorus or another group five element, we call that an n-type uh, semiconductor. And p is just for holes, n is just for electrons. Um, so in the next video, we're going to go over how do we understand doping from a band diagram perspective. And I'm going to undo the little lie that I told you that um, the uh, empty state that you introduce with uh, phosphorus can't actually be occupied by anything. Uh, so that's, that's what's going to be in the next video. Thanks for watching.